Okay. And yes, the director will be doing the Good evening and welcome to you all to the 2009 Hydrostian Distinguished Annual Lecture. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for the evening, um, I'd like to recognize Mrs. Alice Heidostian uh, and the family, uh, Dikran. Cynthia could not be here. She had the same problem I had at the Armenian Studies reception three weeks ago. Uh, I ended up in the hospital. Now she's in the hospital. Uh, so we take turns. She's, uh, she's recuperating, I understand, nicely. And we will miss her. Uh, the uh, speaker this evening is Mr. Thomas Duval from uh, London. Mr. Duval is a journalist by profession, but one who uh, puts to shame some of us historians. Uh, let me say very simply that he has produced the best uh, book uh, on the Garapal issue called The uh, Black Garden, and it will be very difficult to surpass it. And uh, I say that as the author of a book that I'm writing, uh, once I read his book, I decided to change mine. Uh, I'm not going to compete with Thomas. I'm going to bring in other aspects uh, that uh, will uh, hopefully contribute to an understanding of that conflict. Uh, Mr. Duval has been uh, in a number of positions. Uh, in, on a number of occasions, he has uh, been a reporter for BBC World, the World Serv Service Radio. He has been a correspondent in Moscow for the Times of London, for the Moscow Times and The Economist. He has, uh, from 2000 to 2001, he was uh, the Caucasus reporter for uh, BBC. Initially, he started covering Moscow, I believe, but eventually, for some unknown, mysterious reason, he ended up covering the Caucasus. And he has focused more and more on that uh, from 2002 to 2008. Uh, he was the Caucasus editor for the Institute for War and Peace Reporting in London. And most recently, uh, since January this year, he has been with the uh, uh, Concili Conciliation Resources of London that produces wonderful uh, documents uh, studies of a variety of conflicts. They've done a wonderful job with Abkhazia, and they've got one on Garapag. And um, he is, um, uh, he, he has been responsible for the Caucasus region and Garapag issues. And it is a great pleasure and privilege for the Armenian Studies Program to have Tom uh, join us this evening uh, as well as tomorrow at noon, he will be conducting something like an informal discussion at noon at 1 o'clock at the International Institute. And we would, uh, uh, I would uh, ask you to give a warm welcome to Tom. He will speak for about 35, 40 minutes uh, on the challenges of the Caucasus. Um, and he puts the question in a very strange way. Uh, why isn't something happening that should be happening? This is, um, and it's almost counterintuitive. Uh, unity or cooperation in the Caucasus, they're not thinking about it in the Caucasus. But Tom is thinking about it. And that's good enough for us. And they should be thinking. That's the whole key. Once he's done with the presentation, uh, we will, uh, he will accept questions and uh, even answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Zura. Um, and I'd also like to thank, there's a, a funny 
talking about phantoms as a funny ghost-like noise coming out of the microphone. Um, I'd also like to thank um, very much, uh, well, first of all to Jira for inviting me here, and um, his kitchen is definitely the, uh, I think, the center of Caucasian studies in, in Ann Arbor, and very glad to be there. Um, also, thank you to uh, Ingrid for arranging it, and of course, thank you to uh, Mrs. Hydostian and the Hydostian dynasty for arranging this and for making everything possible. I use the word dynasty because I think you're more than the family by what I've gathered from, from this evening. Um, and um, I'm going to be try and be slightly bold this evening as a journalist and um, step back a bit into history. I'm going to be talking about the present but also about the past um, because the subject that I'm tackling about the Caucasus as a region um, has some very interesting parallels, particularly from the earlier part of the 20th century. So this evening I want to talk about a paradox, the paradox of the place that used to be the Trans-Caucasus and is now called the South Caucasus, of how it's both a region and not a region, and why I think that debate is crucially important. I'll take us back into the historical past, and in particular to the period around World War I, when regional unity tragically failed in the Caucasus. And I'll try to discern what might be the, wrong and r the right and wrong directions in search of a shared South Caucasian future. So, first question, is the South Caucasus a region? Well, we call it a region because it consists of three small countries, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, as well as three territories of undetermined status with a 200-year-old history of collective coexistence located in a distinct geographic space. And yet, these lands have never been a voluntary political association or a single viable state. And that, nowadays, this is not so much a region as a mess, a tangle of geographically proximate lands controlled by inward-looking leaders in control of economic cartels, divided from their neighbors by roadblocks, ceasefire lines, and closed borders. The result is that Stepan Akert in Nagorno-Karabakh is closer psychologically and politically to Los Angeles than it is to Ganja, the Azerbaijani city 50 miles away. Skinvali, the capital of South Ossetia, currently has more in common with Tula than with Tbilisi. Some will conclude that this state of affairs exists for good reason, that the idea of a South Caucasus or Trans-Caucasus region is a colonial project that has outlived itself. If the peoples of the Caucasus want to move apart and in different directions, let them do so, the skeptics say. Each can seek his own destiny without being forced into shared living arrangements with his neighbor. In the past, regional integration has failed, and it's better not to push it. I want to argue this evening against that point of view. The point is not a new Soviet-style unit with a single political leadership but a region that seeks cooperation rather than fragmentation. The problem, I contend, is not there isn't enough in common to give the peoples of the South Caucasus a shared project to work on. The problem is that no one has given them the enabling environment to make that happen. More than that, it is my belief that it is this issue which will ultimately cut the knot of the three unresolved conflicts of the South Caucasus over Nagorno-Karabakh, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. At the moment, these disputes are suspended in a state of permanent non-resolution as both sides stick to intransigent, intransigent positions of their right to territorial integrity on the one hand and to claiming a painfully achieved victory of secession on the other. Both sides fear the consequences of giving up these hard-won positions and prefer a miserable status quo to an uncertain future of compromise. Yet those of us who study these conflicts, many of us who study these conflicts, believe that ultimately the best option is some kind of shared sovereignty in which these disputed territories achieve the status of Alsace in the new Europe, a place where borders are open and people are free to choose their own identity. If the town which Armenians call Shushi and Azerbaijanis call Shusha eventually becomes a new Strasbourg, everyone benefits. So what do I base this idea, my rather optimistic idea, of a South Caucasus regional project upon? Well, let's begin with geography, and I think we often underestimate the importance of geography in international affairs. 
In objective terms, this is a distinctive geographic region, on three sides at least. To the west is the Black Sea, to the east the Caspian, to the north the, north, the magnificent Caucasus mountain range, through the heart of which a decent road was built only in the early 19th century. The most fluid and contingent border, and I don't need to remind the Armenians in the audience of this, is to the south and southwest. While the river Araxes forms a convenient barrier to mark much of the southern border of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Nahichevan, it was only drawn by the Russians and Persians in 1828. And for Azerbaijanis, it still stands or runs as a symbol of colonial division. And of course, the fact that Batumi, the city of Batumi on the Black Sea, is part of the Caucasus, quote unquote, while Van, Kars, and Edahan are not, has nothing to do with geography and everything to do with the bloody and tragic events of 1915 to 1921. Nonetheless, political borders also shape identities. And I would say over the past two centuries, these four borders have, have formed a region with a collective identity. The inhabitants of this region also share many cultural features that a visiting anthropologist quickly recognizes. However much urban Europeanized, Europeanized intellectuals in Tbilisi and Yerevan don't like to admit it, the peoples of the Caucasus share an enormous amount in terms of social traditions, music, cooking, family behavior, and the way they celebrate great life rituals, such as weddings and funerals. There's also a persistent intellectual strain, which is often suppressed, but still alive, which identifies common Caucasian traditions formed by history and geography. That tradition was always strongest in emigre public publications, which were, of course, colored by nostalgia. But I do think the distance of S exile also brings a certain clarity of perspective. In 1955, the Circassian scholar, Itek Namitok, wrote a programmatic et essay entitled The Caucasus for a new emigre publication, Caucasian Review, published in Munich. Namitok wrote, the Caucasus became a living museum of the ancient races, the repository of a deep and rich stratification of various cultures, protected by topography against all attacks from outside. This long past has left in the character of the people traces which may be found in the old traditional families, pride in the reflexes of honor and nobility. And as their ethnic conservatism is wedded among Caucasians to extreme individualism, they are naturally hostile to any system which reduces personality to one common level and to any form of oppression as well. 20 years earlier, writing in the Paris-based journal Kafkaz in 1935, the emigre Azerbaijani writer, Mehmet Zadeh Azerbaijan Li, probably a pseudonym, wrote a kind of love letter to the Armenians with similar sentiments. As for the Armenians, he wrote, then they are even closer to us than the Georgians, since the Armenians, almost to a man, used to speak in our language. In everyday habits, our lives were closely intertwined. In our villages, folk singers, ashugs, were almost all Armenians. Our cooking, dress, customs, and behavior were the same. For millennia, we lived not only in mutual trust and respect, but it will not be an exaggeration to say, with real love. These are feelings that the Armenian and Azerbaijani, who are currently co-owners of a carpet shop in the old town in Tbilisi, or traders from Vanadzor and Ganja who do, do business discreetly on Georgian territory would instantly recognize. Finally, of course, economics cleaves this region together, or it should, as well as culture and geography. Since the 1880s, it's had the potential to be a single economic organism, though that has rarely been properly realized. That was when the Russians first built the railway tunnel through the Surami Highlands in central Georgia, for the first time linking the Black and Caspian Seas by train for the first time. North to south, east to west, since then it's had the capacity to, to be a transit route and marketplace that enriches everyone who lives there. In that sense, Armenia needs Abkhazia, Batumi needs Baku, Nahichevan needs Yerevan. Yet, as we all know, politics has constantly driven apart what culture and economic self-interest have brought together. The architecture of this structure is vulnerable to the smallest shocks, and the modern history of the Caucasus has shown this with tragic regularity. In 1905, Georgian Marxists blocked that tunnel through the Surami Highlands with a captured engine and instantly cut the Transcaucasus in two. All political integration projects to combine the lands of the South Caucasus 
have failed. In 1989, as soon as the Soviet Union began to fall apart, the three republics all rushed in different directions <coughs> with different strategic objectives. In 1922, the Bolsheviks attempted to form a single Soviet Transcaucasian Republic, known in Russian by its initials ZFSR, but it didn't prove viable. The three main nationalities of the region preferred to be separate, and the structure was quietly dissolved in 1936. And before that, the one genuine attempt to form a single state out of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, the Transcaucasian Federation of 1918, collapsed only after only one month under the weight of its contradictions and in the face of an advancing Ottoman army. Excuse me. So the years 1918 to 21, when the brief dream of independence faded, are the best lesson in the politics that, that have defeated Caucasian unity. And I want to spend some time considering what happened back then. To go back to those emigre journals of the 1920s and 30s is to read hand-wringing accounts of how the independence project was betrayed when Caucasians forgot their common interests and allowed the Bolsheviks to take over. In these writings, a peaceful Caucasian paradise always seems to be just out of reach, spoiled by the wicked behavior of somebody or other. However, the spin the different authors put on this betrayal reveals how deep the divisions actually were. Either the Caucasus, Caucasians were too close to the Bolsheviks or to Denikin's white army, too close to the Turks or not firmly enough opposed to them. It seems the problem was always someone else. The Georgians, the Abkhaz, the Armenians, the Azerbaijanis, always someone else was not sufficiently loyal and stabbed us in the back. For example, in the journal Kafkaz that I've just referred to, another Azerbaijani writer, Shefi Rustambeli, rather implausibly Manages, manages to overlook episodes such as the sacking of the town of Shusha Shushi in 1920 and blames the Armenians of Karabakh for the fall of independent Azerbaijan to the Bolsheviks. Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold today. Rustambeli writes, by April the 28th, 1920, Azerbaijan, having endured a grave internal political crisis drawn by the combined actions <coughs> of the Armenian government and the command of the 11th Soviet Army into battle with Armenian insurgents in Karabakh, with allied Georgia adopting a completely indifferent and passive position, was basically powerless to resist the armed forces of the attacking Red Army. To foreigners who wanted to help, the problem was elsewhere. It was not so much the Russians as the petty nationalisms of the small Caucasian nations themselves. The 1919 Paris Peace Conference, British Foreign Office official Robert Van Sittart voiced his frustration at the failure of the Caucasian politicians to unite. In the circles of the Supreme Council, <coughs> in the circles of the Supreme Council, many are of the opinion that the Trans-Caucasian Republics have no future at all, as they are unable to achieve any sort of solidarity and are exhausting themselves in conflicts with each other. Is it not clear to you that the dispatch of arms and munitions for you has been delayed precisely because of your diver divergences? because of the fear that these arms would be used in your conflicts with each other, Van Sittart said. Van Sittart was being a little disingenuous. A servant of the British Empire, he should have known only too well that the conflicts of the Caucasus would have been much smaller affairs and much more liable to resolution, but for the fact that Caucasian nations played the role of proxies in great power politics. <clears throat> You could, call it, you could call it the problem of asymmetrical security. <clears throat> Small nations are unable to defend themselves against a determined invader with vastly greater manpower. And that in turn means that they, they ally themselves with the rival great power in order to survive. That's how small communities such as Karabakh, Armenians, or Ossetians have got sucked into the major international rivalries of the day. To get, get involved means fighting a war, but to do nothing is to risk being destroyed. The Georgians learned that lesson way back in 1795 when their capital, Tiflis, was completely destroyed by a Persian army and they subsequently entered into a union with Tsarist Russia. Faced by the 50,000 men of Enver Pasha's Ottoman Third Army in 1918, 
the 70,000 men of the Bolshevik 11th Army in 1920, or indeed the Russian army of 2008, you need a powerful defender. And that won't be a neighbor, but a great power of equal ferocity. That could be the Russia of Catherine the Great, it could be NATO, but it won't be someone local. This is the dynamic by which great power politics pulls the Caucasus apart. So in the end, each of the three South Caucasian countries has end up face, ended up facing these challenges alone. You might call it a structure of disunity. Unfortunate Armenia has always been the loneliest of the three. Those emigre Georgians, Azerbaijanis and Dagestanis, writing from Paris and Warsaw in the 20s and 30s, were particularly exercised by the issue of the Armenians and the Caucasus, and why the Armenians were so wary of joining up in Caucasian federations and societies. The others needed the Armenians as allies in the fight against Bolshevism, but they also wanted an ally in Turkey. And the Armenians, of course, minded more about the country which had just committed genocide against them than about Russia, the country that had merely occupied them. Armenia, the only, land, the only landlocked country in the South Caucasus, has always had the weakest hand to play. For good reasons, it's always needed this regional integration most, and yet has been most cautious about it. We need only remember May 1918, when its Ottoman armies menaced their existence and Georgia found a new ally in Germany, the Armenians were forced to make a declaration of independence that was virtually a suicide note. <clears throat> Armenia needs a stable Georgia. In good times, Georgia is Armenia's route to the west and north, to Europe and Russia. In bad times, Armenia shares Georgia's problems and can do nothing about it. As you know, Russia's vengeful economic sanctions against Georgia in 2006 hit Armenia badly, while the continued closure of the railway through Abkhazia from Russia arguably, <coughs> arguably damages Armenians even more than Russians, even more than Georgians. During last year's conflict between Russia and Georgia, on August the 16th, 2008, the destruction of the Grakali railway bridge in central Georgia immediately halted imports to Armenia for a week and cost the country an estimated half a billion dollars. I should add that Azerbaijan shares some of the same problems. It's also suffered from the Georgian war, as its main pipelines through Georgia were shut down, and it too lost vast amounts of revenue. The same geographical curse was almost fatal for Armenia during its worst ever crisis from 1915 to 1921. James Harbord, the US general, sent in the fall of 1919 by President Woodrow Wilson to study the feasibility of adopting an independent Armenia under a US mandate, mandate identified many of the same problems. He wrote, Georgia does not hesitate to embargo freight against Armenia, and from her position of vantage, simply censors the railway traffic to that unfortunate country. Azerbaijan controls the fuel supply and combines with Georgia against Armenia, which alone of the three has nothing by which to exert leverage. The railroad can neither be consolidated nor properly operated under native control. Roadbed and rolling stock are rapidly deteriorating. An example of the power of Georgia over Armenia is that the latter is not permitted to import either arms or ammunition, though under almost constant menace from its neighbors. Where the First Republic of Armenia faced a struggle to survive at all, <clears throat> the circumstances of the Karabakh War of the 1990s have closed the borders of the Second Republic and made it choose a path of proud isolationism. Out of necessity, Armenia's leaders have built stronger links with Moscow and Tehran than with their Caucasian neighbors. <clears throat> and they have rediscovered links with the worldwide, worldwide Armenian diaspora. But there's a danger here that on some level, Armenians feel that they exist in some kind of postmodern space, that it's separate from the Caucasus. And that's why the imminent opening of the Turkish border presents both such an opportunity, but also such a challenge. Georgia, the central country in the Caucasus, is more blessed by geography, and for that reason, often equivocal about regional cooperation. Perhaps the problem is that it takes the benefits for granted and prefers to avoid the risks. Sharing projects with Armenia and Azerbaijan means benefiting from Caspian Sea energy revenues, having greater access to Iran and Turkey, and lessening tensions with Georgia's Armenian and Azerbaijani minorities. But it also means taking on the burden of Armenia and Azerbaijan's problems, and by extension those of Turkey and Iran. Maybe that's why two traditions in Georgian political thought urge the country down its own separate path. One is the particular introverted tradition of Georgian nationalism embodied by Zviad Gamsakhurdia, which set Georgia apart from the rest of the world. The other is the aggressively Euro-Atlanticist 
worldview of Mikhail Saakashvili and others, which prioritizes the pursuit of membership of Western institutions and NATO in particular over a closer relationship with Armenia, Azerbaijan, or even Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Things are bad now, but let, rem you, but let me remind you again that if they were much worse during and after the First World War. In 1919, James Harbord, the US envoy, painted a picture of utter breakdown in the region. The three governments, from an occidental standpoint, are now thoroughly inefficient, without credit, and undoubtedly corrupt. Alone, each faces inextricable financial difficulties. Religious differences and interracial threaten to embroil them unless brought under a common control. Two of them have no outlet to the Black Sea except through Georgia over the railroad. They have no present intermonetary, postal, or customs union, and have stated no definite agreement for common control and use of the railway, and are in constant squabbles over boundaries. Azerbaijan has no educated class capable of well administering a government. Georgia is threatened by Bolshevism. Armenia is in ruins and partial starvation. Quite a good argument for Caucasian unity there. Harwood's conclusion was dramatic, but utopian. All our investigation, he said, brings conviction that the people in each would welcome a mandatory by a trustworthy outside power. In other words, if the small nations of the Transcaucasus can't sort out their own problems, a bigger power should do it for them. As we know, however, the United States was too far away to take up this challenge, even if it wanted to. And besides, the situation on the ground was changing fast. In fact, in 1919, only one power was willing and able to assume a mandate to govern the Transcaucasus as a single whole, but very much on its own terms. And that, of course, was Bolshevik Russia. So now let's consider the Soviet experiment. Maybe I'm going to be slightly controversial here. It's become customary to utterly condemn the Bolshevik Soviet era in the Caucasus, to treat it, 70 years of, treat it as 70 years of darkness and lost opportunities, and then turn the page. And who indeed can condone a system that committed mass murder? But let's not forget that the USSR existed both before and after Stalin, and that for many older residents of the Caucasus, the Soviet era was a golden age. Many minority peoples, women and workers, still have many good things to say about Soviet rule. Let's also recall the environment of ruin and starvation that Harbord witnessed and in which the Bolsheviks took over. They were opposed by many, but welcomed by many others, amongst them Ossetians, Abkhaz, and Karabakh Armenians. In their own brutal way, they put an end to seven years of strife and disintegration. In an article entitled Our National Policy in the Transcaucasus, published in Pravda on 12th of April 1923, the chief Bolshevik in the Caucasus, Sergo Ojinikidze, makes a spirited defense of the virtues of Bolshevik-imposed integration in, for, in the form of the new Soviet Transcaucasian Federation. He starts by looking back to 1918. Ojinikidze wrote, the formation of separate national republics led to a historically unprecedented worsening of national relations between the Transcaucasian peoples. Wars between the republics over frontiers, the war between Georgia and Armenia, the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, wars inside the republics, the destruction and burning of South Ossetia by the Mensheviks, the war of the Mensheviks with the Ajars, war with the Abkhaz, war, war with the Akhad Sikhin Muslims. The mutual slaughter, in the literal sense of the word, of Muslims and Armenians filled the atmosphere of the Transcaucasus with the poison of hatred. The republics shut themselves off from one another with a Chinese wall of customs barriers. Soviet power intervened in this overheated atmosphere of national hatred. The population sighed with relief. It sensed that an end had come to these horrors. At the height of massacres of Armenians by Muslims in the Shusha Agdam region in Azerbaijan, Soviet power was proclaimed, and the Red Army instantly put a stop to the massacres by its intervention in Soviet Azerbaijan, it was welcomed by the whole population as a savior from bloody horrors, destruction, and devastation. Well, it reads quite well, doesn't it? The paradox of the Bolshevik Soviet Transcaucasus is that by some measures, it was the most successful regional integration project ever. After all, no ethnic conflict was recorded for almost 70 years. The economies were fused with a single currency and transport infrastructure, taking down all those Chinese walls. The region was modernized and standards of healthcare and literacy shot up. And yet, of course, we all know the other side of the coin. The vertical autocratic Soviet system also dealt out <clears throat> hideous and arbitrary violence, shut the region off from the outside world, 
and took away elementary political freedoms. Ironically, nationalism was preserved in a low-level way and eventually filled the vacuum left by the collapse of socialism in the 1980s to devastating effect. The successful regional integration project eventually contained within, this, within itself the seeds of radical disintegration. The ultimate failure of the Soviet project perhaps highlights the limits of colonial rule in the Caucasus, what you might call its ungovernability. If the most centralizing state in history failed to govern the Caucasus, who was anyone else to try? And yet there is a legacy here that because of the still looming shadow of, shadow of Moscow, most Caucasians do not properly appreciate. Over time, it should still be possible to separate the good from the bad. In 1989 to 94, the South Caucasus again went into a spin of disintegration. The centrifugal tendencies of the new independence movements were an understandable reaction to Soviet rule, but I would argue they disastrously threw out the Caucasian baby with the Soviet bathwater. They repeated too many of the mistakes of 1918 that Orjana Kidzi had identified. When Zviad Gamsakhordia organized a rail blockade that brought Soviet Georgia to a halt in 1990, but predicted that a Georgia free of Russians would become Switzerland in a few years, what was he basing his ideas on, apart from nationalist mythology? What was it that drove the Karabakh Armenians to undermine Mikhail Gorbachev's attempts to impose special rule from Moscow and mass economic investment under the relatively enlightened administration of Arkady Volsky in 1989? There was, I believe, an underlying naivety in these nationalist movements that made the new nation's encounter with the modern world much more painful than it should have been. Let me end by turning from past models to the future. Now it's surely time to think of ways of reversing that trend, but through different models, not Soviet ones. Looking ahead, again I make some paradoxical propositions based on my analysis of the past. The South Caucasus cannot afford not to function as a region and undergo some kind of regional integration. That is surely essential for its long-term peace and stability. Yet this regional integration cannot be imposed Soviet style. The time of the centralizing superstate has passed. It has to be achieved by consent, taking into account a wide array of local interests. But thirdly, the South Caucasus needs not only the zoom lens, but the wide angle. By this, I mean that integration projects are dependent on the enabling power of both the neighbors of the South Caucasus, Russia, Turkey, and Iran, and also the European Union and the United States. Outright interventionism, or skewed bilateralism, that we often see from both Moscow and Washington, from any of these powers, in fact, will only replicate the old patterns of asymmetrical security and great power divisions. That's a challenge both to Russia and to the other powers. It means that Russia will have to mind less that other powers take an interest in this region, where it's traditionally been the main hegemon. If Russia could only begin to draw on its vast resources of soft power in the South Caucasus, the prevalence of the Russian language, the presence of million, millions of Caucasian migrant workers in Russia, shared knowledge, knowledge of Russian culture and tradition, it could be a force for soft integration of a virtuous kind that would benefit everyone. At the same time, Russia's clear strategic interests in the region are overplayed in part because of the reluctance of others. If other powers were to invest the same kind of money, resources, and manpower, for example, in Abkhazia that Russia does, something incidentally the Abkhaz would greatly welcome, it would go a long way to turning Abkhazia from a place of division into a place of stability. If there is to be a new model of South Caucasian unity, then it's clear from what I've said it must be based on economic and cultural interests rather than political structures. In other words, it will be more like the European Economic Community, the EEC of the 1970s, than the European Union of today. And yet the natural leader of a project such as this would have to be the European Union. It's frustrating, though, to see that the new Europe has so much experience and exp expertise in this area, but has been so reluctant to use it in the South Caucasus. Compared to the efforts made by Russia or the United States in the region, Europe has been slow and faltering. In the words of one Georgian scholar, Europe is lazy and late. The European Traseca project, started in 1993 for the eight countries of Central Asia and the South Caucasus, has spent less than 200 million euros since then, far less than BP, Gazprom, or USAID has spent in the region, to name three, but three other foreign actors. The Eastern Partnership project of the EU is another laudable idea, but hampered by several constraints. The six countries involved, three in the Caucasus, 
have no membership perspective for the EU, which does not provide a strong incentive for reform. Promises of trade privileges and visa facilitation are more promising, but while foreign ministries want to build a more friendly policy on giving out visas, interior ministries generally undermine them by restricting visas for applicants. The most successful European project in the South Caucasus comes not from the EU, but from the Council of Europe, in which all three countries are members, having joined almost simultaneously in 1999 and 2000. The Council of Europe is successful mostly because it's modest and nudges the three countries to behave better. Through the European Council of Human Rights, the people of the Caucasus have final recourse for issues of justice. Yet it's not a powerful, it's not a powerful instrument. Georgia has not fulfilled its obligations, for example, on the return of Meskhetian Turks, and Armenia and Azerbaijan have both got away with very flawed elections. If the Caucasians wait for Europe, it may be a long wait. We must hope that there are moves for bridge building that come from within. Rather like those emigre journals of the 1920s, I see some seeds of optimism in the virtual space of the internet. Though whether those seeds will be allowed to bear fruit is another matter. For years, the internet in the Caucasus was, was overwhelmingly a forum for official propaganda and abuse. But now there are tentative grassroots initiatives working in the other direction. A new generation of bloggers has grown up. Bloggers of all nationalities have risen to defend, for example, the two brave young Azerbaijanis who were arrested this summer. An Armenian internet blogging, blogger recently wrote about how he was invited to an Azerbaijani wedding in Georgia at the invitation of an Azeri colleague. Nostalgia and virtual reunions are also possible now online. A website called Bak Bakalilila reunites the multinational Baku of the 1970s and 80s. And I love a website entitled Our Class B, which brings together the former pupils of many different nationalities from one class in school number 14 in Suhumi, Abkhazia, who studied together in the 1980s. Nowadays, these ex-pupils live in Suhumi, Tbilisi, Moscow, Siberia, Israel, Ukraine, Israel, I've already said Israel, and Greece. Of course, virtual communities like this are not enough, but they remind us of the bonds that still tie people of the South Caucasus together and how, if the politics can be fixed, there is so much that will instantly connect them together once again. And after all, the first step to the future and to laying the ghost of the past is in the imagination. One day, I believe, the phantom of Caucasian unity can still become a flesh and blood project. Thank you. I have to start in Washington. Are they away from the region? <laughs> How does it work? I think we have to start with peace and unity in Washington, I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Dewar will take questions. We'll start with uh, Professor Sanyana. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, um, you, you got the ideal, you got the agency in the form of the European Union, but let me ask you the question about the framing of the region. Uh, I am a historian, but I would probably uh, push the question towards uh, the recent times. And the question is, of course, about the Caucasian range. And 
connected to it is the North Caucasus. Mm. Now, that gets back to history because the history of the administrative framing of the region included and excluded at a different time the North Caucasus as part of the administrative region. But more recently, uh, you have, and of course you have the Eastern Caucasus, so-called, that includes Dagestan, uh, historically, culturally, and through many ties. But my question is really about the recent trends, and, uh, you know, I'm not in the field, but I've seen some of the reports, that at a certain moment in 2008, Chechnya was basically playing an independent international role. Now, this is not exactly Russia, because you have these regimes, and right across the border, you have a number of very fragile regimes in the North Caucasus, and that might complicate the picture of having a region and a superpower, or a regional power, Russia, just north of the Caucasian range, because you, if that is true, you seem to, to, to have to factor in uh, the trans-border sub-region, if you will, of the North Caucasus, and its, and its role in stabilizing or destabilizing relations in, in South Caucasus. Thank you. Mm. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm not prescriptive. I'm not saying that this idea of, you know, I don't want to start drawing new artificial boundaries of, of this idea. An idea should, should be organic. Um, and, um, you know, the idea of Caucasian unity should be a voluntary one, but it should also include, um, for example, you know, Azerbaijan is in Iran, or, you know, it could have a con also has a connection to Turkey. And there are several categories of people who are sort of both North and South Caucasian. I think the Abkhaz, the Ossetians, um, the Lesgins are three groups who are neither exactly in the North or exactly in the South. They're in both. Um, so I think the North Caucasus is, is you know, it's, it's part of the neighborhood, but it's also different. And I think the, 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 the mountains form a significant barrier. Um, and obviously, they don't have an international dimension, I would argue, in the same way that the countries of the South Caucasus do. They, they, um, their international projection is rather small. Um, Chechnya twice tried to be an independent state and both times failed rather miserably. I saw both attempts for myself. I meant Kabul, the recent one. It yeah, but... Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think... But I think um, Kadyrov is, is more about PR than about reality. I don't, I don't see, um, I, I, think, I don't think his influence on the affairs of the South Caucasus will be very great. I think it's useful to have him as a friendly neighbor rather than as a hostile one, as the Georgians discovered uh, last year. So um, sure, I think it's an issue. Um, and I think North Caucasus is, is a deeply worrying place and for all sorts of reasons we could go into. Um, but I think, um, I suppose the conundrum I'm trying to address here is, is, is how really um, these small nations really, if, if they find ways of working together, the sum is so much greater than the parts. At the moment we have the parts. We don't really have parts, we have pieces, we have fragments. And so um, how we as outsiders should be promoting projects which bring the pieces together, not in a coercive way, in a way that um, the locals actually want, in the way that it's voluntary, um, but in the way that supports them. Um, and I don't see enough of a vision to do that, and that's what, I suppose, the issue I'm trying to address. Thank you. Question? Uh, um, uh, did the agreement that was signed on Saturday between, between Turkey and Armenia, um, sh should we be more optimistic that, that the situation in the Caucasus will improve? Um, my answer to that is basically yes. Um, I must admit, <laughs> just saying to Jira, I haven't actually read the protocols, and I know there are some criticisms about the detail in them. Um, so maybe we should talk. Um, if we want to go into that, I can give you my, my opinion based on not having actually read the detail. But I think, I think um, when we come to Armenia, the issue is how Armenia can come out of its isolation and without you know, remaining true to its history while coming out of its isolation. And I think um, for what, from what I gather, 
people in Armenia um, are generally supportive of these protocols. Um, I think the diaspora takes a different issue because for the diaspora, the issue of um, – well, not all the diaspora, of course. Many, most diaspora organizations have actually backed these protocols, but many in the diaspora, particularly the Dashnaks, um, for them, the issue of the past is, is, is more sacred. But I think um, it's, it's, it's been difficult to live in, in Armenia these last 20 years. Um, um, you've had uh, a border with Iran, which is a, um, a very remote, different, distant border. Um, you've had a border with Georgia, which is a, a very unreliable neighbor. And then these two long borders closed. And I think um, this is a chance for Armenia to open up to the world, um, to breathe a bit more freely. So in that sense, um, it's very positive. But we can talk more about the, the protocols if, if you wish. I'm, my, my view is well, slightly nuanced. I think, basically, I think that the, the distrust is actually uh, much less great than, than it seems on the surface. Um, the Caucasus is a place of gestures, a place of symbols. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the man who dresses up with a sword and a shield and a dagger and chain mail He's not actually saying, I want to kill you. He's saying, I'm strong, I'm powerful. Um, don't I look nice? Um, and I think some, some, something of the same, when people issue threats in the Caucasus, they don't actually mean to carry them out. They're just making a statement about themselves rather than about the others. Um, so I think sometimes we should take a lot of these hostile statements with a pinch of salt. And I've myself have seen so many examples of people who are supposedly enemies when they sit down to dinner Within half an hour, they're drinking merrily and exchanging toasts. Having said that, I think the younger generation um, is, is possibly the, the post-Soviet generation um, is starting to believe some of these myths. And I think that's a particular problem in Azerbaijan, where some of the um, propaganda on television against Armenians is, ext is, is very extreme. But having said that, I think um, you know, give, put these people together for an hour, a day, a week, and, and they find so much in common. Um, um, and um, certainly, I always, I always think they have so much more in common with each other than they do with me. And um, why should I be the one um, going back and forth between them, talking to both sides? Where should they not be, be talking to each other? Susan? Stand up so everyone yeah, I'm really struck by some of the similarities uh, at the beginning of your talk and at the end with Cyprus, which is uh, the UN's most expensive um, success story, I suppose, where 35 years they've maintained peace there, but there's no solution in sight still, really. And in spite of exactly what you're talking about, other people coming in and doing all kinds of wonderful conflict resolution workshops and artist exchanges and people meeting, and also, of course, Turks and Greeks being abroad and going to school together and helping to on an individual level. But when it comes down to a referendum or something like that, it becomes a totally different story. Mm. But as I say, one of the problems is the governments are busy talking to each other, but they're not preparing the people for any kind of a peaceful resolution. So however many times they meet on an individual level, if the governments are still propagandizing or supporting people who do propaganda on their behalf, mm about we will never have a resolution that uh, damage us in any way, then it really doesn't matter how many times Americans and Europeans go in and, and try to uh, maybe mm. together on a local level. Yes, I, although I, I think Cyprus is considerably advanced from um, when you look at, compare Cyprus from Karabakh. I mean, no one... 35 years, but uh, maybe in historical terms that's not too bad. Um, um, and certainly, no one, there's not going to be a war over Cyprus. They've, they've, 
the, you know, they've moved on. Um, um, well, it's unlikely. So it's certainly, you know, they, they, I, I, it'd be hard to find people who, in Cyprus who want to fight a war. So you can look at it in, in negative terms or in positive terms. People, some people go to Northern Ireland, for example, and say, isn't it depressing? There are still walls in the middle of Belfast dividing Protestants from Catholics. But yes, yes, there are, but um, um, that's just a legacy of people years and years feeling insecurity from their neighbors. But the other story is that um, you know, um, people aren't being shot anymore, that, that, that the, um, there's huge prosperity in Northern Ireland. So I, I don't know. It depends whether you think the, the glass is half full or half empty. Certainly, I think these things take a lot of time. Um, and I think there is a danger, which is, which is that the mediators become part of the furniture, that they, that they, they become, um, and maybe the UN in Cyprus has, has fallen into that trap, that they start to become um, essential to the problem. The problem needs the mediators um, as much as it needs the conflicting parties. And of course, that's dangerous. Um, the, the two parties ideally should be sitting down without mediators. Um, and I think this is a particular problem in the Caucasus is, 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 is um, um, constantly um, blaming the mediators, looking to the mediators to sort out your problems. When, things br when, when talks break down, saying it's all the fault of the Mintz group or the OSC or whatever, rather than looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, what could I be doing? Thank you. Well, from the perspective of the Caucasus, of course, the Balkans looks like a success story. Uh, so again, it's where, where, what perspective you look, you know. Um, um, there's been no war since uh, the end of the Bosnian War, you know. Um, the uh, um, Slovenia and now joined the EU, Croatia is next. Um, so um, again, it's, it's, it's which end of the telescope are you looking looking from. And, I, I, and of course there is, I think the point of the EU is that there has to be an incentive there to get closer. And in the Balkans there is that incentive. There is a long-term perspective of membership. And I think the problem in the Caucasus is there isn't that long-term perspective of membership. Um, having said that, there are, there are big carrots that the EU could be having. And I was mentioned talking about trade and I was talking about visas. Um, because um, where are the other models for the... <laughs> See, we don't get fragmented <laughs> problems just in, in the Caucasus. Um, where, where are the other models that the South Caucasus can look to? Um, Iran, not really. Russia, not really. So, you know, there is a model there um, to aspire to, which is the model of Europe. And I think um, if the EU can be offering carrots and saying, you get these carrots if you work together more. And look what happened to us with our economic integration and our economic cooperation as a, as a route to some kind of unity. Um, then, it, then, then it can be positive. I'm not saying, but I, I, in many ways, I share your frustration. I think this is a, you act far too slowly. It doesn't care enough. Um, and it risks um, having if it doesn't do enough, it risks having far greater problems in the Caucasus. It risks the Caucasus going bad, and then the EU will be the one um, called in to clear it up. Um, the question was, would Mos Moscow prefer dealing with a unified region or with three separate states with different policies? And I, and I think the answer is obviously the second, that Moscow prefers dealing with three separate states. Um, so 
Um, having said that, I'm always a li little bit skeptical about the role of Russia as the big bad wolf in the Caucasus. As I mentioned in, in the lecture, I think it is the big bad wolf only partly because other uh, powers let it be. Um, and also, I think Russia's influence in the Caucasus, it does have influence there, but, but actually the, the, the local actors are pretty strong and they push back if they want to. Um, and there is, a, there is a considerable factor that, that if Russia, I think the Russians are always calibrating their response. If they move in too much, they're, they're, they're afraid of, um, of being pushed out. Um, and I've heard it quoted Vladimir Putin being asked why he didn't do push harder on the Karabakh question. He said, I don't want to be this Russia, this problem to be too closely associated with Russia. If it becomes too clo closely associated with Russia, we have to deal with the burden, the burden of it. So, which is why I try and let the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis get on with it. Of course, he's being a little disingenuous there, but I think there's an inclination to, to, to believe that the Russians are more powerful than they actually are in the Caucasus. Yeah, I have a question about, about the role of Europe in, in the Caucasus. You, you mentioned it's one of the main parts of how you think the sort of the roadmap for a unified, peaceful South Caucasus is economic uh, links, I guess, and integration with Europe. If you, can make a, if you took a cynical perspective, you could say the only reason Europe is interested in this region is for the Black Sea oil. And there's a fairly well- Caspian Sea oil. Caspian sea oil. Yeah, Well, I, I wouldn't entirely agree with that. I think, obviously, gas in particular is a big issue in Europe nowadays, and obviously the Caspian Sea will be a source of gas over the next 20, 30 years. Having said that, the EU does have a kind of foreign policy based on the idea that um, it's good to have democratic neighbors, it's good to have strong neighbors, which are strong states rather than weak states. I think this is, you know, this is the whole story of EU expansion, which is about um, um, we, we, we want nice, strong neighbors rather than, and, and I think the EU actually doesn't like dealing with, with, um, with dictatorships. It feels a bit uh, uncomfortable, maybe far away ones. Um, in, it, it, Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's an issue with Azerbaijan that 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 that, that it's um, the current regime is is seen as is seen as stable, and and therefore you know um, we don't want to rock the boat too much. Although having said that, the, there's been some pretty strong interventions from all sorts of EU foreign ministers on the issue of these two bloggers who are in jail. You know, I, I can you know I know they, they needn't have raised the issue if they felt. And they were going to upset the Azeri leadership, and they've been quite strong. I think um, so. I think there is a there is definitely an economic dimension there. Um, but you should also uh, the funny thing about the Caucasus is that for purely I think accidental reason re reasons, all three countries in the Caucasus have quite powerful lobbies uh, in the West. Um, the Azerbaijanis because of oil and gas. The Georgians because um, well, they're Georgians, you know, they have, they're very good at being kind of charming and European and speaking English and making the right arguments, um, even now. And, and the Armenians because of the diaspora. So all, all three countries have got quite powerful lobbies, which, so, so um, this means that foreign policy to the Caucasus has balances between these interests. I don't think it's a particularly healthy phenomenon. I would rather that, that um, and this is again my theme, that rather that people form their foreign policies on a vision of the Caucasus as a whole rather than on three bilateral relationships. I think that would be much healthier, but at least um, there is that balance of interest.
Um, the question was about the, the um, recent European Commission investigation into the, um, the war of 2008 and what, what did I think of this um, investigation. I, I had a good look at it. I, I was slightly disappointed. I, I used to know Heidi Tagliavini quite well, who was the head of the commission, and I respect her. But I, I think they put a lot of, an awful lot of work into it, and they still, and they came up with, I'm sure, broadly the right conclusions um, that it was Georgia who started the war, but after much provocation from Russia, and I think that's basically what happened. I would have expected them to, to address some of the more. more of the details of, of what happened um, in the run-up to the war um, um, in some more detail. I'm sure they had answers to that. Um, so that disappointed me a bit. Um, I've been working on this small book on the Caucasus at the moment, writing that chapter. Um, and um, I've been sort of you know, compiling my own reconstruction of what happened. Um, and I expected it to be more helpful for, for me than it actually was. Right. Okay, that's a huge question. Um, question. Uh, the question was about um, the bad tendencies. The bad tendencies. The question was about the bad tendencies of, of, of after Kosovo and recognition of uh, independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, I mean, my, my my view on this is is that um, we have to be pragmatic. That um, you know. Um, the breakup of these multinational states, Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, was a messy business. And if Kosovo and Abkhazia and South Ossetia didn't fit in, then we can't on just go endlessly repeating that these states have to be held together for some kind of precedent. We have to look for some more creative solutions. And it's not as though there aren't creative solutions around the world. Look at the example of Taiwan, you know, which um, um, international countries um, have offices, they have representatives there, they trade with Taiwan, it's one of the biggest economies in the world, and yet it's not a recognized state. Um, and um, I think if we can live with Taiwan in the world, we can certainly live with Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Kosovo. So um, I think for me the issue, for, with, particularly with Abkhazia, is we should be engaging much more strongly with Abkhazia. We should not just be leaving it to the Russians, we should be saying, let's go and set up a U.S. office and the EU office in Abkhazia. Let's, um, you know, allow them to travel. Let's give them sea links to Turkey. Let's um, open them up to the world. Um, and the, if the Georgians object, they say, "Well, what would you rather? Would you rather that there was a, um, you know, Belgians and Americans sitting in Sukhumi or Russian generals?" So um, um, I, I really don't think the, the Georgians have an argument there. So I, I think I think. Um, we've got to come up with some more creative solutions to these um, unrecognized entities. That's my view. Ron, and then uh, Well, uh, I really thank you for a great talk. I, I, was, I was very taken by your very suggestive suggestion that we proceed primarily on economic and cultural fronts. 
rather than political. That's no surprise. But following the questions of these two young fellows about Russia and, and the situation there, um, it seems to me that it may not be Russia so much that would be against integration. If there were integration in the Caucasus that was friendly to Russia, yeah. that didn't, that in some ways excluded NATO expansion, so yeah. they'd be perfectly happy with that. It's actually, it seems to me, more the West problem mm -hmm. than, and not only oil companies, but, but actually governments, because they, they can divide and rule in a much more effective way and basically keep Russia out. So my question is, would, would you argue, and this is perhaps too extreme, but something I think may actually be the best solution, would you argue in some ways a greater role for Russia, you know, or a very influential role, a recognition of their special security interests in the region, not quite imperial, but some hegemonic role, uh, might not be a way to bring these mm. together. Yeah, I mean, I can see an argument for that. I, I, I certainly personally think that, that the idea of NATO expansion was a big mistake for, for Georgia. I think it, it, it contributed to Georgia losing Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, and that um, it would be, have been much wiser to look at the region as a whole and come up with some kind of security system that um, was common to the whole region, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Um, and probably some kind of neutrality, um, some kind of, you know, again, look at Finland. I mean, Finland is a member of the EU. It, um, it's, um, it's not a member of NATO, but um, it has perfectly good relations with Russia, despite some recent very nasty history with Russia. So that's, again, an example of a country which is a, a neighbor with Russia, but has come to some kind of security accommodation um, with Russia, and why shouldn't the Caucasus um, head down that route? And, and I think once you've once you've sort of solved the problem of Russian paranoia, as it were, um, about um, on the security side, then I think you can start working on much more positive things. And um, don't forget that um, I've been again doing looking back over the f the files and the agencies um, in May 2004. There was a Georgian-Russian business forum in Tbilisi um, in which um, the, the Russian economics minister came down. Saakashvili said, Russia will be our main business partner. They were encouraging Russian investments. The Georgians are not stupid. They realized, well, they weren't stupid at that moment. <laughs> they realized that you know, Russia was where the money was. Um, and they welcomed. Russian investments, they, and they, they, they knew the Russians wouldn't be squeamish about investing in things that, you know, Americans and British people would be squeamish investing in. So I think there's, there's, there's again, there's a huge amount which could be exploited there, which isn't being, and I think probably with, with, with Georgia, it's just the mess is too big, but um, um, there's certainly, um, you know, R Russia can and will play a role in the Caucasus. Um, so I think it's just a matter of other places, other countries getting in there too, saying, OK, Russia's going to be there, but that's inevitable. Let's get in there too, and also sol solving the security issue. Thank you. One last question. Well, um, I think there will there will be problems and bumps, and and um, obviously, as you yourself were saying yesterday, I think it's no secret that that, that um, there could be unforeseen consequences if, for example, um, there's unconditional support for the government in Yerevan as a result of these accords 
which enables them to crack down on the opposition, that would be a bad consequence, um, could be a bad consequence of, of these accords. But it's my feeling that, that generally, why is this, why are these new relationships a good thing? Because I think we've, for too long we've been stuck in a kind of vicious circle in the Caucasus, um, whereby relationships are broken um, and that in turn benefits certain mafias and economic cartels who want the relationships to be broken. That in turn poisons the politics. So certain kinds of politicians get elected to parliaments. That in turn means that the good people leave. W w w these conflicts don't just, you know, that they affect more than just the refugees and the borders. They affect the whole atmosphere, the whole psychology, the whole mood of the nation. And if we can start breaking some of these cycles and getting into virtuous circles in which, in which people are crossing these borders again um, and people are actually um, rebuilding relationships, um, then I think that will have a knock-on effect on many other things. And I can, Armenian-Georgian relations, you know, um, I think can only benefit from the fact that, that, that um, Armenia has got, if Armenia's problems are reduced, then there's less incentive to um, be, um, have problems over, over, over the Georgian relationship. The, I think you know, that there are better people go into politics, um, there's more trade, that could affect, have a positive effect on Javakheti. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm, we're still a long way from that, but I can see um, in an optimistic scenario in which, which we get into a, a virtuous spiral of events in the Caucasus rather than just a bad one. Thank you very much.